All right, welcome back to EBE. What I thought I would do for the first part of the lecture is uh, go ahead and go back through that take-home exam number three. <coughs> uh, remember, none of this is going to end up on the final, but if you're kind of curious as to exactly what I'm looking for in each of these questions, this should be able to provide you with some of that information. Okay, so let's start out with this first one. <clears throat> Ficus rubiginosa is a species of Manetius fig, figs are trees, uh, that's endemic to Australia. The fig tree species interacts regularly with a host-specific wasp species. The wasp transfers pollen from one fig tree to another, and the wasp also lays eggs within the ovules of the fig. The ovules with wasp eggs do not result in offspring for the fig, while those ovules without wasp eggs develop obviously into seeds. Okay, So from what's written above, you could argue that the interaction was either mutualistic or parasitic. How would the interaction be able to be classified as a parasitism host interaction and be specific to the fig and the wasp? Well, the, the fig is losing resources to the wasp. The ovules that the wasps lay eggs in are a loss for the plant. That's a negative. And therefore, if we just look at uh, what the wasp is doing with its eggs, the wasp gains resources for its offspring, and maybe a little place to hide, and the plant loses, that makes this a positive-negative interaction, which is a consumer resource interaction, and then more specifically, probably a parasitism because it's not killing the host, but it's, it's taking resources, etc. Okay? All right, based on the above, how would the interaction be able to be classified as a mutualism and again be specific to the fig and the wasp? Well, the wasp transfers pollen. That sounds like a dispersive mutualism to me. So if we just think about pollen transfer, the wasp is transporting pollen from one plant to the other. That increases outbreeding for the plant, increases genetic variation, reduces the likelihood of breeding with closely related individuals. So in that case, the plant is getting its alleles moved to another individual for reproduction, and it's doing it in a very efficient way that benefits the plant. The wasp, as it transfers pollen, it's also moving around laying eggs, so it's gaining a benefit from the plant in terms of resources for its offspring. So, just in reading this, you could pretty reasonably, right, you could probably argue either that it's a parasitism or a mutualism. Now, going into the part three of this question, from what you've written above, and in the above, you've told me two things. Hey, it could be parasitism. Hey, it could be mutualism. Depends on how I think about it. All right? And then I say, how would we decide whether this interaction is, in fact, classified as a mutualism or a parasitism? Because it can't be both. It has to be one or the other. And then I put this note in here to keep you from telling me, gee, I think it's this or I think it's that. I'm, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for how do you make a decision about what it is. Not what the decision is based on what you think, but how you would set this up to figure out what kind of an interaction it actually is. Not what you conclude it is, but how would you decide what it is. What's the logic for getting to the answer, not what the answer is. Okay? A lot of you did really well on this. Uh, one approach is to say, well, what I could do is uh, prevent the wasp from ever interacting with some of these. I could look at the fig with the wasp, and I could look at the fig without the wasp, and I could compare these to each other. If in the presence of the wasp, the fig does better than in the absence of the wasp, that sounds like a mutualism. If, on the other hand, the fig does better without the wasp than it does with the wasp, then the argument would be parasitism. 
a lot of you use language like compare this to that. Uh, look at these two situations and compare them. That's the logic I'm looking for is does the fig do better overall with the wasp or without the wasp? And once you figure out that answer, then you can pick one of these. <clears throat> I took off a couple points if in this question you drew a conclusion that was contrary to one of your answers up here. If you said, gee, I think it's a mutualism, then I'm wondering what this argument is that you made up here. How did you decide this was better than that one? I need this language in there in order for me to uh, feel good about your decision. Okay. All right. A group of astronauts, Alpha Centauri, in 2095, of the 100 astronauts, 95 are homozygous dominant uh, for wild type, and 5 carry the recessive allele for ACHU syndrome. Uh, that's real. I didn't make that up. There is a syndrome called ACHU syndrome where whenever people look at the sun, they sneeze. All right, what's the frequency of the wild-type allele, the dominant allele, and the Achu allele? Right, so we have 100 astronauts. That's 200 alleles. 200 alleles goes on the bottom. And we would get two dominant alleles from each of these. That's 190 plus 5 is 195, 195 divided by 200 is 0.975, and then we can do the same thing here, the frequency of the recessive allele is 5 divided by 200 alleles, Go back to our calculator. 5 divided by 200 is 0 0.025. So that's the answer to the first one. If no evolutionary forces are, are at work, then we can assume that the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and then this would be the predicted frequency of the homozygous dominant, the predicted frequency of the heterozygote, and the predicted frequency of individuals with Achu syndrome, the homozygous recessive. So if we say that the frequency of A is P, and the frequency of little a is Q, then 0.975 times 0.975 equals p squared, that equals the frequency of these, 2 times 0.975 times 0 0.025 equals 2pq, that's the frequency of the heterozygote, and then 0 0.025 times 0 0.025 is equal to q squared equals the frequency of the homozygous recessive. 0.975 times 0.975 is 0.95. 2 times 0.975 times 0 0.025 is 0 0.04875. And then point. 0 0.025 times 0 0.025 equals 1, 2, 3, 6, 2, 5. Now the question says, when there are 10,000 individuals in the population, what's the frequency or expected number of each of these genotypes? So then you would just take 10,000 times 0.95, Ten times point nine five. That's ninety five hundred and point zero four eight 
seven five times ten thousand forty eight. Whether you kept the point five in or not doesn't really matter to me. I'm I'm working at the logic that you're dealing with here, and then point two three six two five times ten. And that's 625. Roughly, it sums to 9,993, which to me is close enough. Again, you could leave in those decimals if you wanted. I'm working at the logic of the problem, not the exact number. Okay. All right, snakes. Here's uh, from this paper. You could have looked up the paper if you wanted and got more information about it. Uh, that could have helped you a little bit. The horizontal dotted line represents the expected proportion of attacks. The vertical line represents the maximum latitude for coral snakes. So the coral snakes exist at this latitude and lower. So they're more subtropical species. And if you go up to these higher latitudes, the coral snake just isn't around. This is the frequency of attacks on this species, that's not the coral snake, by birds. This species, the scarlet king snake, uh, is a banded snake. We don't know anything about it, but we do know something about coral snakes. They have aposomatic coloration, and they're highly toxic. So it looks like the scarlet king snake when it's with coral snakes, doesn't get attacked, right? It looks like there's some confused bird here, but for the most part, it doesn't get attacked. Where coral snakes do not occur, it gets attacked quite a bit, including some populations where the attacks are greater than 90%, okay? We expect this many attacks. It's getting attacked much lower than that with the king snakes, or sorry, with the coral snakes, and much higher than that in the absence of the coral snakes. So, these guys are banded snakes. The coral snakes are banded snakes. Okay? These snakes have aposomatic coloration, and we know coral snakes do as well, because I wrote that in the question. So, these guys are mimicking the coral snakes. And because they're getting attacked more often when the birds don't have familiarity with the coral snakes, this suggests Batesian mimicry. Batesian mimicry is where somebody that's palatable, i.e. not toxic, mimics somebody that's unpalatable, i.e. the coral snakes. The king snake is palatable because it gets attacked a lot if birds don't have experience with coral snakes. Right? If this were a Mullerian mimic, I would expect these dots to be down here whether or not the coral snake was present. Okay. All right, populations of moose, caribou <clears throat> fluctuate and their numbers go down, and they go down at the same time that there's this little increase in wolf density, and then people go crazy. This is a true story in northern Canada and Alaska. Given what we learned about predator-prey dynamics, is there inherent reason to worry? So if this is uh, a population size of the caribou and moose at low population size, the idea is that the wolf population is going to come down, and as it comes down, the caribou population goes up, and as it goes up, the wolf population comes up, and then the caribou population comes down, and you get this uh, periodic cycling where the predator and the prey are slightly out of phase with one another. So a, a good way to argue in this question would be, yeah, but as soon as the... Uh, moose, caribou, and deer population comes down, the wolf population is going to get hammered, and then they're going to come down, and then the other species should recover, and that should bring the wolves back up, and then we go down again. Okay? Probably the best way to answer that question. 
right. Cowtail stingray, preyed upon by sharks, and the stingray employs uh, a number of behaviors to avoid predation, including crypsis, tail barbs, toxin, and sociality. So I left this in here in case you wanted to look up more about it. Uh, based on your answers, it looked like only a couple people bothered to check this paper. Uh, <clears throat> two hypotheses for the... You can answer it without that. I, I've used this question on exams. You don't need to look it up. But if you looked it up, you would have more insights. Uh, two hypotheses for the anti-predation benefit that stingrays might derive from being social. One is you could have watch stingrays that look out for predators or uh, you could have the larger stingrays kind of circle the wagons around the, the weaker ones and protect them like uh, what elephants do or bison. Uh, you can get schooling behavior that's possible, right? Messing up the search image of the predator, etc. All right, detail of hypotheses for why these stingrays might be in larger groups in clear water and in smaller groups in turbid water. Okay? All right, relate these to predation and lack of predation. So, in clear water, it's pretty easy to understand. The idea is uh, they can be seen, and because they can be seen, they can employ all these sociality adaptations, uh, potentially, to disrupt the sharks from feeding on them. Does that make sense? So we've got this idea of the... Uh, clear water leading to these anti-predation mechanisms that you talked about in Part A. Now, in Part B, a lot of people kind of argued, well, the stingrays don't need to be in large groups in kind of turbid water. But that doesn't really answer the question because if you gain all these benefits by being in a group, then why wouldn't you stay in a group, even in turbid water, because sharks could still potentially find you. They just have to be closer to you. In which case, all of these safety in numbers or circling the wagons adaptations would still have a benefit in turbid water, albeit the shark just has to be closer to you. So a lot of you dealt with this by saying, well, are there any disadvantages to being in a group? That is, are there any advantages to not being in a group? In which case, you're only in a group when things are really bad, but you gain a benefit by not being in a group, 